Welcome to Five Books for Catholics, where an expert selects and explains five outstanding books in some aspect of Catholic life, doctrine, or culture. Of Purgatory, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches the following. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The Church gives the name Purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The Church formulated her doctrine of faith on Purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the Church, by reference to certain texts of scriptures, speaks of a cleansing fire, This teaching is also based on the practice of prayer for the dead, already mentioned in sacred scripture. As 2 Maccabees 12.46 says, Therefore Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin. From the beginning, the church has honoured the memory of the dead and offered prayers and suffrage for them, above all, the Eucharistic sacrifice, so that, thus purified, they may attain the beatific vision of God. The Church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. That was from Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1030 to 1032. In this interview, Father Luke Wilgenbush selects and discusses some of the best books on purgatory and prayer for the deceased. Luke Wilkenbush is a priest of the Diocese of Nashville, where he currently serves as Director of Vocations. He is the author of Saved as Through Fire, a Thomistic Account of Purgatory, Temporal Punishment and Satisfaction, which was published by Emmaus Academic. Links to the books mentioned in this episode are available in the show notes. And if you have a moment, please support this podcast by leaving a top rating on the platform of your choice. Father Luke Wilgenbush, welcome. Thank you. What is purgatory? That's a great question. Um, So purgatory is a a teaching of the church. It's a doctrine that the souls after death who die in a state of grace and, and receive that judgment from the Lord in their particular judgment, but are not yet perfectly prepared for heaven, Uh, They would pass through this experience known as purgatory. It's a way to purify them and to prepare them for their entrance into heaven. And where does scripture allude to purgatory? It's a great question. You know, obviously the word purgatory doesn't appear in scripture, uh, as many terms actually connected to our faith. The word trinity, for instance, also doesn't appear in in scripture, but it's it's pretty clear that that both of those teachings do come from scripture. I think the, the best um, citations for purgatory. There'd be one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. First from the Old Testament is 2 Maccabees. So there's this story about the the fighters who kept amulets on their persons, you know, in, in the fighting, which was against God's command, and, and they died and, and they lost the battle. And as they were kind of investigating what happened, they discovered these amulets. And so it said that um, Judas Maccabeus said, you know, let us offer, you know, atonement for their sins, uh, at the temple. And it scripture kind of says there, it is a good and holy thought to pray for the dead. And so even in the Old Testament, we see this idea that there could be souls who would benefit from our prayers. Uh, so clearly they're in a state of need, uh, and yet they're not totally abandoned by God or, or sort of deprived of the opportunity to receive his mercy. Uh, and so that already suggests some kind of awareness of an intermediate state, so to speak. And then the the kind of principal New Testament passages from 1 Corinthians. So St. Paul is, is kind of talking about what we're doing in this Christian life. And he talks about sort of laying a foundation and then we build upon the foundation. And, and some can build with these really durable materials and, and others can build with hay and, and straw and, and these kind of things. And, and he talks about how after this life, uh, if the foundation is good, the foundation will remain. Uh, but that which is imperfect, the hay and the straw and, and these kind of things, uh, will be burned up. But then it says, but the person himself will be saved uh, as through fire. And so there's this recognition that there's some kind of purification taking place uh, 
even though that fundamental connection uh, with the Lord remains intact. And, and so we kind of see that as a teaching on purgatory. And, and there's a few other passages, but, but those would be kind of the main ones. The church's teaching on purgatory is based not just on scripture, but on tradition too, primarily the Lex Orandi, the law of prayer. Which aspects of, what are the main aspects of tradition which manifest the church's belief in purgatory and the efficacy of prayer for the deceased? Sure, yeah. I mean, from, from time immemorial, it's been the practice of the church to to pray for the dead. And and there, even in that idea of praying for the dead, just like I spoke about with Second Maccabees, um, there's kind of two fundamental beliefs that are contained in that practice. One is that there are souls that could benefit from prayer, uh, which means that they're in this relationship with God, uh, and yet there's something that's imperfect about it. And two, that our prayers are actually effective to do that. Um, and that's kind of been a, you know, we might almost say a sort of spiritual instinct of the faithful. You know, it's certainly something we receive from our Jewish tradition, as I cited, but it was a practice of the church from the very, very beginning. Um, you know, we would offer masses for the dead in particular. That's um, That's been kind of the principal thing. I mean, certainly other kinds of prayer for the dead are very valuable, and, and that's been a part of our faith as well. But where this really focused in the early church and, and um, up to our day, but especially through the Middle Ages as well, was offering masses for the dead. You mentioned earlier that the church teaches about the existence of purgatory, but is it just a doctrine or has the church defined the existence of purgatory dogmatically? Yeah, it has been um, defined dogmatically as well. I think it was the Council of Florence was one of the key um, councils that really clearly delineated this this dogma about um, about purgatory, the existence of purgatory, but also um, kind of always in line with that was this um, dogma about the efficacy of our prayers and offering masses for the souls in purgatory. And that, that council was held um, sort of in the context of the conversation with the, the Orthodox at that point, you know, there had been the Great Schism and there was a, attempts at reconciliation and these kind of things. And so Florence was really big on that. And then, of course, uh, Trent, which was kind of similar, but even broader with respect to all this, um, the controversy around the, the Protestant Reformation and things like that, really solidified the teaching um, and also emphasized even more, I would say, a, a sort of associated um, teaching of the church about uh, the satisfaction, um, certainly that Christ has made satisfaction for our sins, but that we as Catholics, um, that we as Christians participate in offering satisfaction along with Christ. So that was really tied in more, which um, is a pretty important part of purgatory as well. You mentioned the Council of Florence and how it sought to uh, heal the schism between the Catholic and the Eastern churches. Do Orthodox churches believe in purgatory? A great question. Um, I would say that the Orthodox churches in general, um, it, it may, might be unfair to generalize too much, but in general, tend to have a view of purgatory, which they, they do believe in in general, but they have a view of purgatory that's actually much similar to um, an idea of purgatory you might find in, in a lot of modern Protestant um, denominations that are kind of interested in, in purgatory. So essentially, they, they believe that there's this middle state. Um, but in general, they tend to deny any sort of um, retributive purpose, so to speak, to, to purgatory. It tends to be much more about the kind of just subjective transformation of the soul uh, and things like that. So they they really don't, um, they don't want to put any kind of stock in the idea that the soul is suffering to um, to make reparation to divine justice and things like that. They really want to say that that's all taken care of, but this is just a process of kind of transformation. But they do. They do believe in purgatory. And they don't use the term, but there's a middle state for them. And the Protestant reformers contested the doctrine of purgatory, most famously Martin Luther with his invectives against indulgences. What are the main Protestant objections to purgatory? Yeah, so the, the principal Protestant objection, and, and this would be, um, to, again, to kind of paint in broad strokes, I've already sort of alluded to it, but the idea of purgatory, in as much as it has a retributive value, and what I mean by that is sort of making reparation to divine justice, recognizing that there's some uh, suffering that I should have to endure uh, along with Christ and in union with Christ, of course, uh, 
but there's something that I should have to do to make reparation to divine justice. Protestants, um, pretty much by and large, want to say that Christ has completely done that. And any sense of, you know, we would talk about participation, you know, rather than um, substitution or anything like that. But they essentially say to suggest that the individual human soul has any responsibility or capability to make reparation for sins would be offensive to the cross of Christ, to say that somehow Christ is not completely satisfied for sin. So they they really reject um, what I would call from our Catholic perspective, the doctrine of participation, that yes, Christ does these things, he does them perfectly and completely, but we are other Christ, as St. Paul says, it, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, right? We're taking on the life of Christ, we, we take up our cross along with him. Uh, and that idea is is really it goes very much against the the theology of the Protestant churches in general. On the one hand, people will often come to a priest and ask him to offer masses for their deceased loved ones, even if they might not practice that much. So that gives the impression that people, a lot of the faithful don't have any problem getting their heads around the doctrine, at least in practice. Is that correct? Or do people struggle to accept and make sense of purgatory today? Yeah, it's interesting. I think on a, maybe on a more conceptual level or doctrinal level, I think there, there is more, more struggle with it today for some reason. I think, um, you know, you'll kind of hear people say, well, you know, does the church still teach purgatory? (laughs) You know, these kind of things, which is um, obviously, you know, it's, it's kind of to misunderstand the nature of church teaching in general, that it might change on, on something like that. Um, so I think when it comes to understanding what purgatory is and why it's necessary and what's taking place, I, I do think there's a lot of confusion uh, in, in many, many Catholics' minds. Uh, but on the other side, I, I think, you know, what has been there from the beginning, this sort of instinct of the faithful almost that we should be praying for the dead and that there's something beautiful and holy about that um, still remains relatively strong. And I think that that's a good place to kind of go to talk to people about purgatory as well as to kind of tap into that 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 very natural, in a certain sense, spiritual insight that that we should be praying for the dead, and and if we should be praying for them and offering masses for them, which is pretty uncontroversial for most Catholics, then then that says something about purgatory. Luther did not put an end to indulgences. The Church continues to draw on a treasury and grant indulgences to those who fulfil the necessary conditions. The Catechism says an indulgence is obtained through the Church by virtue of the power of binding and loosing granted by Christ Jesus, intervenes in favour of individual Christians and opens for them the treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints to obtain from the Father of mercies the remission of the temporal punishments due for their sins. What is an indulgence? That's a great question. Yeah, so an indulgence is essentially a gift of the church from a treasury of satisfaction that Christ and the saints have left to the church. So the idea being that Christ is satisfied perfectly for our sins, uh, but according to this principle of participation, right, each Christian has a certain responsibility to participate in making reparation for their own sins. Um, But some souls have been so conformed to Christ during their life that they've surpassed the responsibility that they would have had for their own sins uh, but like Christ kind of gave their life away in this extraordinary way. Um, the the earliest and, and kind of most obvious examples of this would be the martyrs, right? The martyrs gave their life in union with Christ, which is um, this kind of super abundant satisfaction. But we can also think about uh, maybe even some of the more mystical saints that would be kind of categorized as victim souls and things like that. You know, it's this intense suffering. And, and it's not to say that God delights in the suffering itself, but He's drawn the soul into this unique and profound relationship with Christ where they are participating like him and making reparation for the sins of the world. Uh, So then it it kind of follows from that, that um, that which is given on behalf of the whole body is to be distributed to the members of that body according to the judgment of of the person with responsibility for that body. So all that to say that when you give a gift to the whole church, it's ultimately the Holy Father's decision how how to apply that to the benefit of the faithful. And so an indulgence is essentially the authority of the church saying, when any of the faithful perform these actions, we are going to grant them a gift of satisfaction, of reparation for their sins from this treasury left to us by Christ and the saints. Do Catholics therefore need to take the temporal punishment of sin more seriously, 
and make a greater effort to offer satisfaction for the temporal punishment of their own sins and those of others? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, certainly we need to see these things in, um, in relationship, you know, it would be, it would be disordered to kind of be very, um, concerned about temporal punishment, but not to be concerned about being in a state of grace or something like that. Like grace and charity is obviously the first priority. Um, but it's not a distinct concern to be thinking about making reparation and satisfaction and these kind of things, because when you love God, which is what charity is, which is what being in a state of grace is, you're going to be uh, concerned, so to speak, about divine justice. It's going to grieve you to recognize the way in which sin offends God's justice. And so the love is still primary, but that the more you love God, the more you're going to be concerned about temporal punishment and the more you're going to want to make satisfaction. Um, and, and yeah, so I think, you know, we, we live in a very, very comfortable age by and large, we live in, um, you know, we've, we really haven't emphasized penance as much in the life of the church recently. Um, I think out of a concern to make sure that the priority was in the right order, but, um, you know, if, if we keep kind of first things first, then actually we should be talking more about penance. Um, so I think, yeah, it's definitely uh, important to sort of encourage a renewal of, of concern about these things. And satisfaction is one of the four acts which constitute the sacrament of penance. Absolutely. It's not yeah. just the confession and the absolution, it's the contrition and satisfaction as well. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think we should be taking that more seriously as well, you know, um, really seeing that as an integral part of, of what we're doing uh, when, we're, when we're repenting of sin. You've published Saved as Through Fire, a Thomistic account of purgatory, temporal punishment and satisfaction. What drew you to write a book on this subject? Sure. Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. So the book kind of came as a fruit of my work uh, getting a license in, in theology. So that's an ecclesiastical degree, the, the STL. And as a part of that, as any normal kind of higher education degree, um, you have to write a thesis. And so the topic that I sort of started down was kind of trying to understand what we actually mean by temporal punishment and I remember really struggling that with that in my um, sort of introductory level classes, especially the question first came to me really through studying baptism, because in, in baptism, you know, with respect to baptism, we say that the soul is cleansed of all temporal punishment at baptism, you know, such that if a soul dies, uh, is baptized on its deathbed, rather, it would go directly to heaven. There's nothing that impedes its entrance into beatitude at that point. So that was clear. And yet Often when we talk about temporal punishment, we talk about these kind of interior consequences. You know, if I eat a lot of food, I'm going to be more inclined to gluttony. And it's obvious that that doesn't necessarily automatically go away with baptism. And so the way we talk about temporal punishment was different than how we talk about temporal punishment being remitted at baptism. And so I really wanted to kind of understand, well, what actually is temporal punishment? Um, and sort of the the context um, that's most connected with temporal punishment is purgatory, because if you don't finish your temporal pun punishment in this life, then you'll finish it in purgatory. So that question kind of led me to purgatory. I finished the thesis, um, and my director at the time said, well, you know, this is great. I think you've kind of really unpacked some very important concepts, and if you're willing and able, I think you could really try and expand this into a book. And the the timing was was providential, I guess, in a certain sense, because I finished during COVID. And so, um, you know, I was a priest with um, kind of a couple months before my assignment would begin and, and things were very slow. And so I had the opportunity to write a couple more chapters and, and that's what got it ready to, to be a book. Some of the concepts you cover in the book are the debt of guilt, reatis culpe, the debt of punishment, reatus pene, and temporal punishment and satisfaction. Could you explain these concepts? Yeah, sure. So um, temporal punishment, as I was just kind of talking about, is a is a pretty broad concept, um, which is why we kind of hear it being spoken about in different ways. And so when someone says temporal punishment, they might mean a number of different things. In, in the broadest sense, it's the consequence of sin, um, kind of accepting the eternal punishment, which is, you know, the loss of, of the beatific vision and, and the loss of the presence of God in, in heaven and things like that. Um, so, so temporal punishment is really broad, and so it's helpful to break it down into these different categories. And so uh, one of those categories is um, 
that, that might be helpful to talk about this is reatus culpe, which is guilt. Um, guilt doesn't mean the, the feeling of guilt, like, oh, I feel guilty. You know, it's, it's not uh, an emotion. But reatus culpe is essentially to say that there's some uh, damage that's done to my relationship of friendship with God. And obviously that can be um, you know, a grave uh, break uh, in the sense of a mortal sin, right? Where I've, I've broken my relationship with God. And then there can also be deviations or, or sort of interruptions in the perfection of that relationship through venial sin. And so um, what we have to do to restore or, or to heal, so to speak, the reatus culpe, the guilt, is to rectify our relationship with God, which is contrition, essentially, right? It's to reorder my life perfectly uh, to God and, and to charity, which which unites me with him. Distinct from that, there are other consequences. And so sometimes we talk about these interior consequences, right? Like, like I was just saying, if I eat too much, then uh, I'm going to struggle with gluttony in the future and things like that. That's a kind of interior consequence. But that's different than this notion of reatus pene, which is... Um, that's, when I was studying temporal punishment, right, this is the thing that was kind of like, this is what I've been looking for is, is this concept. And it's very common in, um, in theologians throughout the history of the church. Uh, it's essentially the idea that when I have committed a sin, I have acted against the order of divine justice. And we can talk about different orders of justice that we're subject to as human beings. There's divine justice in, in the broadest level. There's um, Sort of the the order of creation. There's even the the civil society and the and the state that we're we're subject to as as citizens and things like that. There's the family, uh, and so when we commit a, a sin against an order of justice, so to speak, the idea is that we owe reparation to that justice. Just as I've used my will to kind of exert myself over that order of justice. So um, I need to deny my will. And, and if I'm not willing to do that personally to make uh, reparation, then the authority of that order of justice has the responsibility to inflict some kind of punishment. Um, but obviously, it's best when that punishment is voluntary. And when it is voluntary, we call that satisfaction. Um, we tend to not like the term punishment, but it's really very common. And, and we know it very well in, in life. I mean, parents do this with children, the state does this with criminals, and, and God also asks for uh, reparation to divine justice. It's part of his His justice to to require this, and it's a beautiful and, and it's a good and holy thing. So all that to say that satisfaction is the way that we voluntarily recognize our own reatus pene and, and make reparation to heal that. Thank you for listening. To read or listen to the rest of this interview and gain full access to our archive, visit fivebooksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way more people can discover it. You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one euro can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again, and God bless.